Hello everyone, my name is Kelsey Bazell and I am the illustrator of How to Talk to a Tiger. This book is filled with over a hundred animal illustrations and it was really fun to draw. Today I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite pages and what I liked about illustrating each one. How to Talk to a Tiger and Other Animals Written by Jason Biddle, illustrated by Kelsey Bazell. That's me. To start off, I'm going to share the cover of How to Talk to a Tiger with you. That's what we're looking at now. All the animals that are shown on the front, the birds, the bugs, and the beasts, are included in the interior of the book, where you can learn more about how they each uniquely communicate. I'll be sharing a few of my favorite pages from each of the four chapters. I'll read a little bit about a few of the animals and talk about what I enjoyed most about illustrating each page. The first chapter is Sights. This is the first page of the book, and as you can see, this has a tiger in it, so the namesake of the book is How to Talk to a Tiger. We're looking at a tiger. So you want to talk to a tiger. Tigers communicate with each other in a variety of ways, including with sounds, scents, and touches, but you can learn most of what you need to know by watching a tiger's tail. Tigers are the largest cats on earth, and as such, their tails can stretch out three feet in length. If a tiger's tail is held high and so softly swishing, the animal is interested in being social. Perhaps it's exploring a new area or making contact with another tiger for mating purposes. If the tail is held low and loose, then the tiger is relaxed and calm. But if the tail starts to thrash or twitch from left to right, then watch out. That means the tiger is scared, nervous, or displaying aggression. Now, what I really liked about illustrating this page is that um, first, there's a lot of animals on here, so it kind of introduces just that there's a lot of animals in this book. You can see there's a great white shark, there's a gorilla, there's a giraffe, a tortoise, and a loris, and then obviously there's a tiger. And the tiger is surrounded by some jungle, trees, um, and some bugs. And what I really liked about illustrating this page in particular, I liked all of the animals, but the tiger was by far the most fun. And the intention here is that the tiger is kind of staring you down and you're needing to figure out what the tiger is saying to you. Now its tail is twitching a little bit. So reading through the book, you can decide how you feel um, this tiger is communicating with you. Staring you in the face. This, this page is also um, from Sites, and this one's called Plain Possum. A hungry coyote scampers through the forest in search of a meal. It's been days since the animal last ate, ate. and finally its patience is rewarded as it spots a medium-sized mammal waddling on the path ahead. It's an opossum, the coyote realizes. Yum! Opossums are no match for a coyote. They don't have big teeth, nor claws, nor venom, nor spines and so the coyote attacks. But as soon as the coyote's teeth sink into the North American's only marsupial, sorry, into North America's only marsupial, the opossum goes limp. Not only that, but the opossum's eyes roll back into its head, drool pours out of its mouth, its ears start twitching, and it poops everywhere. The coyote persists, and that's when a nasty, foul-smelling green goo squirts out of, uh, out of a pair of glands on the opossum's bottom. The coyote takes a whiff and gags and runs away. After a while, the opossum rolls back onto its feet and goes about, about its day. This is known as, the, as death feigning, plain dead, and it's all an act. A clever ruse that allows the lowly opossum to beat a predator many times its size. So what I really liked about illustrating this page was partially the expressions on all the animals. So all of these animals in some capacity are um, feigning death, right? They're pretending to be dead. Um, and then there's the coyotes who we heard were trying to eat the opossum. So the possum is laying here pretending to be dead and drooling, kind of glaring out of the side of his eyes. Um, while the coyotes are running away and they're making yucky faces and they were really fun to draw because it's, it's rare that you get to kind of make animals this expressive when you're also trying to draw them sort of realistically so they look a little bit like the real animal 
And then, you know, I've got over to the side Ladybug, and it's kind of plain dead, so it's got a grumpy little face. Um, we've got a fire toad laying on its back, um, and then a nursery web, web spider who's also plain dead. Um, and then the snake down at the bottom, which I'll show um, in a minute. That's one of my favorites as well, and I'll read, I'll read the story about that snake down there. Star turn. When hognose snakes are threatened by a predator, these small squat snakes first puff up and try to make themselves appear larger. They also hiss loudly and bite the air. But if that doesn't scare off whatever is bothering them, hognose snakes have another trick. All at once, the serpents flip onto their backs, exposing their creamy white bellies, and begin to writhe like they've just been tossed into a frying pan. Their mouths gape wide open and their tongues wriggle and thrash. And then they coil up into a ball and become still. This death feigning is an Oscar worthy per performance. So again, I just really enjoyed illustrating these pages because of the expression. So the snake was really fun to draw, for, you know, flopping over in a very dramatic way, pretending he's, he's dead. The second chapter is sounds. Do wolves really howl at the moon? The ah ah of a gray wolf's howl may be well may well be the most recognizable sound in the animal kingdom, but it's also probably the most misunderstood. The idea that wolves howl at the moon has been bouncing around for thousands of years, but the truth is there's no evidence that wolves vocalize at the moon or that they use Earth's big, bright satellite as anything more than a source of light on an otherwise dark night. But gray wolves do howl quite a bit, and there's a good reason for it. So this was actually one of the first pages I illustrated for the book, one of the first ones I finished. Um, and so it is special to me for that reason, but I also really love wolves, um, and I just find them to be really interesting animals. So here you can see that they're howling um, at the moon, and there's some baby wolves kind of running down the the snowy hill right there and then I also really like this page just because this was kind of about animals that I didn't necessarily know about um, or know about why they made the certain sounds they did so the doles whistle while they work um, that's a fun one to read and then the howler monkey I really like too and the African wild dogs um, communicate through sneezes which I thought was quite funny and then you can see the prairie dogs down at the bottom use yips to communicate <laughs> The world's loudest land animal. There's a species of monkey in the rainforests of Central and South America that is so loud that everyone calls them howler monkeys. The world's loudest land animal can be heard close to three miles away thanks to a big, hollow, U-shaped bone in its throat, known as the hyoid, which amplifies its roar. A howler's vocalizations advertises how big and bad it is to all the other males in the area. So, in other words, instead of duking it out in the treetops, which could lead to injury or even death, howlers first try and settle their wars with words. Just really, really loud words. And I just really love drawing this howler monkey because he looks like he's yelling, and we don't know what he's yelling at, um, but he looks quite upset and worried, and I just got a kick out of that um, and really enjoyed drawing him. So this is also under sounds. Elephants have earth-shaking conversations. Elephants communicate with infrasounds, waves that are so far down on the frequency scale that they are also outside a human's range of hearing. These sounds are made by passing air across the animal's vocal cords the same way that humans sing. The only difference is that the elephant's vocal cords are eight times larger than ours, so the sound that comes out is lower in frequency. I really love elephants and I really love drawing these, these ones in particular, especially with the birds that are kind of interacting with them. So the bird that's dancing to the side, um, listening for their sounds, and then the bird that's kind of hanging out on the back of the other elephant. And then the baby elephant, which is listening to the adult elephants talk. <laughs> Here's
Here's a close-up of that dancing bird and the elephants. Now here's the really interesting part. Because elephant sound, sorry, because elephant sound waves are so low and so loud, they can actually travel through the ground for up to six miles. Kind of like a mini version of how an earthquake sends shock waves through the earth. In fact, scientists are able to measure elephant infrasound using a device known as a seismometer, which is the same thing they use to measure earthquakes. Another animal on this page that I really enjoyed drawing was the tarsier, um, and I learned some interesting facts about it, which I'm going to read to you now. The tarsier's silent scream. One day, a team of researchers was watching some Philippine tarsiers in the lab when they noticed the animals opening their mouths, but no sound came out, almost as if they were yawning. Curious, they used a special sound recorder and discovered the critters weren't yawning at all. They were screaming. Tarsiers, it seems, are the world's only primates to screech in ultrasound, or pitches so high the human ear can't even register them as noise. Moths and catydids, some of the tarsiers' favorite foods, also make sounds in the ultrasonic range. That means tarsiers may well be using ultrasound to send secret messages, undetectable by their predators, but also as a shortcut for finding dinner. And I really love drawing this little tarsier because it's screaming, but it also looks like it's having the best time ever. Um, and that's one of my favorite things about illustrating animals is they're just really expressive, um, and you get very you can get very human-like expressions from them. Um, and the big eyes of the tarsier really helped this um, be very expressive. So the third chapter is smell and taste. The splash zone. If you ever go to the zoo, be careful not to stand too close to a hippopotamus. Not because they grow to weigh as much as four tons or move at speeds approaching 19 miles per hour, though both statistics are impressive. No, you want to be careful because these semi-aquatic herbivores can fling their feces, or poo, up to 6.5 feet through the air. Get too close and you'll be smacked up in the middle of the splash zone. So if you had ever asked me when I became an illustrator if I would be drawing um, animal poop on one of my books, I would have told you no, that that didn't make any sense. But here I am. I, have an, I am an illustrator who has now drawn a spread about poop, animal poop. And this one was just really fun to draw because I was basically told um, by the art director to, you know, show the poop flying everywhere and have some of it on the trees. And then there's these little fish that are eating the poop because that's part of their um, food source. So it was just really fun to think of all of these hippos hanging around a watering hole and flinging poop everywhere. Um, again, kind of a weird page because it's about poop, but really fun page to draw. And all of these hippos are clearly having a great time. The other animals um, down at the bottom were really fun to draw too. Um, you can see that they're they're also related to poop. So this page is called, what I affectionately call the poop age. Hippos accomplish this yucky feat by using their tails like a propeller. As the poo exits the animal's backside, it hits the tail and launches into the air in all directions. So if you're wondering how they actually do this and get it into the trees, that's how they use their tails. Odd shapes. Wombats, a type of buck-toothed marsupial, use middens to mark the edges of their territories. Wombat poop piles are extra special because these curious critters are the only known animals on Earth that poos out cubes. Now, when I was illustrating this, I knew what wombats looked like. I, thought, I think wombats are very cute, but I had no idea that they pooed cubes. And sure enough, I looked it up online, and they do. And... You know, there's there's some reason that scientists think that this happens, but it's it's kind of unexplained, and so it's just this kind of funky thing, and they're basically the only animal that does it. Um, so if anyone says that you can't poop a cube, you can say wombats can. All right, and the final chapter, chapter four, is electrosensory and touch. A whip scorpion's tender caress. 
Have you ever heard the expression, if looks could kill? That was most likely written about whip scorpions. Whip scorpions aren't actually scorpions. They're arachnids that rank up there on the list of creepy crawlies. They have shiny black exoskeletons and faces that look like a Swiss army knife of horrific appendages built for shredding insects and other tiny creatures. More specifically, or sorry, more technically, known as amblyoglids, I probably um, didn't pronounce that correctly, <laughs> but I guessed. These critters also have eight legs that are so long and spindly in some species that their wingspans stretch out to more than two feet in length. Oh, and some varieties can also spew a spicy, vinegar-like acid from their backsides, earning the creatures yet another name, vinegaroons. The thing about whip scorpions is that while they look nightmare like nightmare monsters, these arachnids are actually almost completely harmless to humans. What's more, females can be very motherly with their brood. Before their little minions grow up and become adults, the mother whip scorpion and her young will move around in a pack, with the mother caressing her brood with her long whip-like feelers. Scientists think that the whip scorpion's whips play a role in communicating with the babies, keeping them nearby and maybe even calming them like a mother cooing to her baby. So what I really liked about illustrating this page, and actually it was quite, it was a little bit of a difficult page to illustrate for um, part of it. The whip scorpion was hard to draw. Um, and that's because the real image of these arachnids is terrifying. I mean, they, they look like a scary animal. Like it says, they're harmless to humans. So something that looks scary isn't always really scary. But I was like, how am I going to make this animal look cute? Because it's supposed to be, you know, tending to its the little babies that are on, on its back. And you can see the babies are quite happy. And they've all got little smiles. And their mother is caressing them with their whip, with the whips, um, which are kind of these long um, antennae-like things that are coming out um, where their arms are coming out too. So it was a challenge to make this look like a nice, um, tender creature when all the pictures I found of it were not nice and tender. Um, you should look one up if you get a chance and see what they really look like and then look at the picture in the book and you'll see, um, you know, how that was maybe a challenge. I had to draw some spiders in this book too and I never thought I would be drawing um, happy or cute spiders, but I did it in this book. Sea otters are cuddly looking floating fur sausages native to the North Pacific Ocean. If you watch sea otters for long enough, you'll likely see them boop snoots. Touching noses is a way for the animals to maintain social relationships, and it's one way touching plays a role in otter communication. Sea otters can and do fall asleep while floating on their backs, which presents a very real danger for getting caught up in the current. To combat this, otters will hold hands with each other to create a sort of fuzzy raft and then take turns napping while the others make sure the whole crew doesn't get washed out to sea. And I just really love this because I um, live in the Pacific Northwest, so um, I am very familiar with sea otters, but I actually didn't know that that's why they held on to each other. So learning that, they're actually helping make sure that nobody gets swept out to sea, I felt like was a really sweet thing to learn um, about the otters. It's electric. Imagine being able to talk to a friend in the next room by shooting electricity from your fingertips. Technically, that's what you do every time you use a smartphone. But did you know that a whole bunch of fish can perform the same magic trick using nothing but their guts? Everybody's heard of the electric eel, which by the way, is not really an eel, but a species of knife fish, which are closely related to catfish. Electric catfish just doesn't have the same ring to it though, does it? Electric eels are what's known as a strongly electric fish. These fish are capable of generating enough volts to zap anything around them, whether it's a crocodile trying to eat the electric fish for dinner or another fish that's, that the eel wants to eat. The effect of all the underwater voltage is that, that the target animal's muscles seize up, paralyzing it, which gives the shocker a few moments to either make an escape or to slurp up an easy meal. 
And I really liked illustrating this um, page just because, A, I think electric eels are really interesting creatures, and I didn't actually know that much about them or how they did this. Um, so it was great to learn about that. And then I also really like, you know, crocodiles and alligators. So drawing um, an alligator was really fun and just the interaction. You can see that the alligator is quite shocked um, by what's happening to him. So this is the last page I'm going to share with you guys today, and I just want to say um, thank you for listening and listening to what I had to say about each page, and then thanks to Jason Biddle for writing such wonderful words that I got to read to you today. So now I would like to share a little bit about how to draw an animal from the book. When I was thinking about which animal I wanted to share how to draw with you guys, I decided on the hippopotamus, um, which is what is shown on what I affectionately call the poo page. Um, hippopotamuses are really great to draw because they have some very simple shapes and you can draw them kind of in a bunch of different positions, um, but those basic shapes don't change. So to join me today, get crayons, markers, pencils, and some paper, um, and we'll draw together. And then when I'm done showing you how to draw the hippopotamus, spend a little extra time um, filling in some details, maybe filling in a background, um, and then go ahead and put that drawing on your refrigerator or on your wall because art is meant to be enjoyed. So let's learn how to draw a hippopotamus. The first thing when you are drawing a hippopotamus and really any animal is that you should find some photos of the animal you want to draw. This is really helpful um, just to reference as you're drawing to notice um, you know the shape of the body, the shape of the head, some of the details of the animal. So what do its legs look like? The hippopotamus has quite short legs, the body is quite round, the head is quite round, and the neck is quite thick. So some animals have long thin necks, some animals have short chunky necks, the hippopotamus is in the second category. Um, and similar with legs, right? Some animals have long legs, some animals have short legs. So we want to look at a picture of the animal to get an idea of what we're drawing first. After you've looked at the overall shape of the body, you should look at some of the details of the animal as well. So we can see that the hippo has some toes, it has a little short tail, little short ears, it has kind of bulgy eyes um, that are that are quite unique. They have a ridge um, that help them kind of like pop out. And then the snout is quite long and the mouth is quite large. So we want to kind of think about that as we think about drawing this animal. And there's other details you might notice. Um, the rough, rough skin, there's no hair on this animal except on the tail, um, and there's some kind of rolls of fat around the neck. Those are things that you can add in as details later, and that will add your own unique kind of stamp to the animal. So to start drawing a hippopotamus, the first step is to draw the body. The body of the hippopotamus is a elongated circle, so that is kind of an oval shape. And you want it to be fairly straight um, horizontally, so the top and the bottom are fairly straight doesn't have to be perfect. No drawing has to be perfect. And that's what part of being an illustrator is. If you don't draw it perfectly, um, that's just your illustration style and you adapt and you move on. So after you've drawn the body, you're going to go ahead and you're going to draw the head. Now the head of the hippopotamus, as we saw in the picture, it's, it's, a, it's actually an oval too, but I like to make this as more of a bean shaped oval. So we can see that there's a snout on one side and kind of the top of the head on the other. So you can see that there's a little dip in the top of this. Um, and as I add details to it later, um, you'll see how that looks more like a head. Next, we're going to connect the body and the head together. So that's just two simple kind of arc lines. And again, if we look at our photo of the hippo, if we remind ourselves of what that looks like, um, their necks are quite thick. And so make sure that's a, a quite, you know, there's enough room there um, between the two shapes, and so it's a very thick neck, not a thin, um, small neck. After that, we're going to draw the legs. And you can draw quite lightly for these circles. These are kind of the general shapes of the legs. Um, and again, these are elongated circles, so they are ovals, ultimately. And I've made them a little bit smaller at the bottom where the feet will be and a little 
larger at the top where the legs connect to the body. Um, and that's just naturally the proportions of most legs and most animals where your leg gets a little bit bigger at the top. So I've drawn those in and when you're drawing legs, those can be really hard. Um, they're a little bit more simple in a hippo because the hippo's legs are so like stout um, or short that you don't have to worry about the joints quite as much. But if you have a really long-legged animal, um, you know, the, the leg might actually be a couple ovals to get the segments right. So they can be a little bit difficult. The main thing you need to remember is that there are um, four legs total and two legs are gonna be kind of towards the front of us and two legs are gonna be towards the back. So you can see that two of the oval shapes I've drawn are towards the front and crossing over the body and then two are essentially disappearing behind the body. As long as there's two towards the back side of the animal and two towards the front, front of the animal, um, it should turn out okay. Next, we'll draw some details. So we'll start with the tail. This is a really simple little arc shape. Um, and you can draw it up higher, down a little bit lower. If you draw, want to draw it like the hippos on the poo page, um, you know, maybe it's swishing a little bit, so it's a little bit longer and a little bit higher. Next, we'll draw the ears. These are two simple arcs. Um, or loops and they just connect to the head so you'll see that they kind of join to that little bean shape I drew earlier um, and one is more towards the front and one is more towards the back and then we'll draw the mouth now if you look at the photo of the hippo this mouth that I drew is not exactly how a real hippo's mouth looks and part of the reason that I drew the hippo mouth hippo's mouth like this and but you'll see that in the books, is that I wanted the hippos to look like they were really happy. And so I had to kind of upturn the mouth at the end, which is where you see that kind of hook or that loop at the end. So when you look at the hippo's face, the, the mouth is just gonna be shaped a little bit differently than the way I've illustrated it here. And that's totally normal for, for illustration where you are making things up as you go along to make the animal more expressive. So as long as it's representing the animal well enough, um, but also representing the expression, you are in a good place. Next, we're going to draw another arc or another loop type shape. And this is going to be the ridge for those eyes. So when we looked at the hippo picture, remember that there was kind of a ridge around the eye. So that's the ridge right there. Next, you're going to draw the eye. And eyes and mouth, so we already drew the mouth, but eyes and mouth are very important parts of animals and people when we're drawing them. They're very expressive. So mouth and eyes can show whether an animal is happy or sad or mad or looking to the side or looking down or sleeping or resting, whatever they're doing. The eyes and the mouth are going to help tell that story. So I've already made the hippo's mouth quite happy with that upturned end. And so the eyes are gonna express that same thing. And this hippo, hippo is um, kind of looking back maybe towards a friend, maybe they're playing and they, they have a happy eye basically. You could draw your hippo's mouth differently and you could draw the eye differently to express something different. So maybe it's a sleepy hippo or maybe it's so happy that its eyes are closed you might draw the hippo with closed eyes, or maybe you want it looking forward. Maybe it's looking towards the watering hole. Um, and so you want to change the position of the eye. That is up to you as the artist. And so you can make that eye whatever you want it to be. Next, we're gonna add the nose. And so this is another loop or an upside down arc. And that is just to kind of like help contain um, the space for the nose. And then the rest of the nose comes with the nostril. So that is the hole that the hippos breathe through. And hippos obviously use these when they're in the water. So um, their nostrils are quite important and um, they need them when they're swimming. Next, now if you, I'm gonna go back to the first, the, the slide before really quickly. And then I'm gonna go forward again. Next, you can see what I've added is just bolder lines. And what I've chosen to add bold lines to is essentially the outline of this animal form. This is allowing me to highlight the legs a little bit more. And you'll see I haven't added feet yet. That will come in a minute. But because I drew the hippo as a oval and then kind of a bean-shaped oval initially, those are helpful guides for me, but ultimately what I want to stand out is the whole shape of the hippo. So I've gone back over the outline, including the legs, and really highlighted what I want to be, um, to stand out more. 
And so you can choose to do that. You could also do something like this with like shading or when you color it in or you add more detail, but we want the main shapes to kind of come forward and then some of the guidelines to essentially diminish. And if you're drawing with pencil, this is really easy to do. If you're drawing with pen um, or markers or crayons, it might be a little bit harder for you to do. But ultimately those guidelines are also okay to keep in there too because it kind of shows how you've drawn things as an illustrator. I'll also say, um, you know, anything that touches air, so body parts when you're in drawing something, if it touches air, the line weights might want to be a little bit more bold. Next, I'm adding the feet. And if you remember back to the photo that I shared initially, hippos do have toes. So I've made sure that these feet I've drawn have some toes um, that are kind of articulated. And that, that's basically the end. That is our hippo. Um, let me show you all of the steps in a more quick sequence. And let's watch that again. And one more time. So, as I said in my intro to this, Please make sure you add some details. Go ahead and color this in. Um, you know, make it kind of a purpley pink like hippos are. Add in that rough skin. Maybe add some hair to the tail. And then add a background. Do you want it to be, um, do you want there to be some trees with some poop on them? Do you want it to be just, you know, hanging out in the watering hole? What do you want this hippo to be doing? And then when you're done with that, please go ahead and hang it up on the fridge, put it up on your wall, and enjoy it as your piece of art. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed drawing the hippo. Please rewatch this and draw as many hippos as you want. Um, go look at hippos um, on the internet. Go look at other animals on the internet and draw to your heart's content. Thank you.